speak to us. May we respond according to your holy word at the given time. For we love you and we praise you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Amen. Well, we're in Acts 14. We've been traveling through the book of Acts, and now we're at a place where we see intense persecution. And it makes you wonder, I guess it makes me wonder at least, uh, is it really worth it? All this persecution, all this hatred towards Paul, is the Christian life, is the mission-led life worth it? And then I think about this. I think about the, the fact that humans, us, all of us, right, we make these things called micro-calculations every single moment of every single day. Now, it could be as simple as Fruit Loops or Cheerios in the morning, and for some reason you do a cost-benefit analysis and you say, I'm going with Fruit Loops today because, man, I ate healthy yesterday, and I don't need that heart-healthy stuff, right? And you make this calculation. Sometimes we're terrible at it. Well, I like to think that sometimes I'm pretty decent at it, right? Maybe that's what, what everyone thinks. Micro-calculations is what causes heroes in war to be heroes in war. It's what causes people like those men and women on Flight 93 on 9-11 to stand up and take back that plane against all odds, knowing that they're going to die. That's what happens when something is worth it, you're willing to sacrifice. And in an instant, you know it's worth it. You know it's worth the risk. That the reward that you could get from that greatly outweighs any cost. Including your own life. Paul knew this. Christ knew this. And so that's why when we see this passage in Acts 14 about these evil and despicable men from, from Antioch and Iconium coming through to where they're at in Lystra and persuading the crowd to revolt against Paul in verse 19. They drag him out, they stone him, and it's worth it to him. It's worth the suffering. And so there are dangers in the mission-led life, but there are delights and a mission-led life. And that's why this sermon, obviously, is called The Dangers and Delights. Because, yes, there is risk. But the reward for faithfully following God far outweighs any risk. So here is, is a simple argument that I'm going to try and make for you today. Take the risk and follow God. Let Him lead your life. And I would say the example of Paul here in Acts 14 demonstrates that to the fullest degree. It starts with him being stoned, be almost to the brink of death, so much so that this crowd, a group of angry, uh, angry people, thought he was dead. They dragged him to the edge of the city and left him there to die. And it reminds us of something. Something that comes out of Matthew 10, 22. This is what Christ says. You will be hated by all because of my name. Now what I'm going to say to you is slightly different, but same vein. And this is our first point. The world will hate you because of the call of Christ. The world will hate. That's the word, hate. It's such a strong word. I don't like my kids using the word hate. You know why? Because it's so... Ugh, it doesn't feel right. And I find myself using it all the time. I, but I have a really bad double standard for my kids. I, I say, I hate, I hate fried okra. I hate this. I hate that. And, and it's never any real hate. We, we don't understand what hate really means because we use it in such a trivial way. But when we see the word hate, we don't just mean, oh, I don't like that. That's what we like to portray. These guys didn't just not like Paul. They hated him so much that they left their town. We're in ancient days here. We're not talking about hopping in the car and driving across town. 
We're talking about walking all this way because they're so steamed up and angry that they go all the way to this town, gather people along the way, and this mob comes to kill him. That's their only purpose. And all of their existence as a mob was to kill this man. This man who was toting around, it, just the, the passage before, was being toted around as, as Zeus and Hermes. These men, that, that's who they wanted to kill. That's hate. It drives you to that degree. The world will hate you. They will pursue you furiously, like Saul pursued David in the wilderness, like Absalom pursued David in the wilderness. They will try to hunt you down because of the call of Christ. And it's a horrible thing. Paul talks about this moment in verse 19 in 2 Corinthians 11 when he talks about all his suffering that he endured. And Paul is listing these hardships after hardship, and then he just says, very tiny, once I was stoned. That's it. That's it. That's all he says. He doesn't go into detail. For him, it's just another little thing. Another day in the life of Paul. He's getting stoned outside of a city, and it's not a big deal. Why? Because the risk is worth it. The reward that he got from this, the call of Christ, is worth it. And so we see that uh, they drag his lifeless body out of town. They thought he was dead. And, and something, this is something that, by, by the way, that Jewish people, good Jewish people, would never do. Touching a dead body, dragging it out of town, not doing a proper ceremony. This was a, a Jewish man after all. You see how angry and how filled with hate they are that they ignore their very laws that they abide try to abide by they dragged him out thinking he was dead disrespected his body killed him or tried to kill him with cruelty but paul was still alive and i i just love that i love that it, what it says here is uh is that when when the disciples gathered about him he rose up just like that and I, I don't want to over-spiritualize this point, but there is power in people supporting you. And I don't want to over-spiritualize I don't want to tell you that you're going to just miraculously be better every time you're in the church and feel great, but it does help. And I think the gathering of the people here is significant because so often we as Christians like to do it on our own. If Paul was on his own in this and didn't have other brothers and sisters lifting him up, He'd be dead in a ditch. But instead, they came around him and he rose up just like that and went back into that city that he just got dragged out of. And then the next day he went on business as usual. This is to remind us of something, that your suffering should be used to bring God glory. That yes, the world will hate you, but you can use that suffering you endure to bring God glory because he goes back into that city and then he starts going on mission again. He never loses sight of what he's supposed to do. In Philippians 1, 21, Paul, throughout his whole life, he, I'm sure this is his mantra. He says this, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And there's no better example than that, than this, of this, then right here in Acts 14, when he says, yeah, you're going to stone me, you're going to try and kill me, you're going to leave me out to, de to die out in the wilderness, guess what? I'm going to keep going. Kill me all you want. And he just keeps going and going. So he goes back into Lystra. He goes back over. Now he's going over to Derby to preach the gospel to people. He's sharing the gospel with all these people over there. And when, in verse 21, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, we're talking, when, when, the, when the Bible uses that word many, it's kind of a, a hard concept. We're not talking about three or four. I think it was droves of people again, tons of people coming to Christ. 
like a Billy Graham crusade, just flooding down, wanting to hear the gospel. And so now in Derby, this is happening. It takes time. He's there for a while. He goes back over after he's done there, back over to the city he just got stoned in, back to Iconium, where, where the people are from that stoned him, back to Antioch, where it all started, the persecution started. And, and this is just an amazing thing that I don't know if I have the strength for. Ask yourself that question. Would you do this? It's hard to know. It's hard to imagine. It's also hard to imagine being on that Flight 93 and seeing terrorists take it over and stand up against them. We don't know what we do in times, intense times of conflict. We have no clue what we do until we're in those times. What we need to make sure we do the right thing is to know this thing, to absorb the Word of God, to dwell in it, so that our default in those times of conflict is the gospel. It's not some nice saying or some, some uh, you know, good affirmation in the morning, nothing like that. It's a gospel that makes sure that we have peace when the world around us is crazy, when people are trying to kill you, when, when terrorists are taking the plane. It is courage that is built up from God himself that we have. I remember when my uh, older brother, not, not Nick, who plays the piano, my older brother, he went off to the military uh, right after I graduated college, and I, uh, he went in as an officer, so that's why he was older, uh, and I took his room at my parents' house. I came back because there was this girl I was, I was sweet on, you know, and so I wanted to move back to Cincinnati, and, and, uh, and so Rachel and I were dating at the time, and, and I wanted to be close, so that's what we did. And in Frank's room, my older brother, he had a whiteboard. And this whiteboard had a verse on it. It was Joshua 1.9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. I love that. Do not tremble or be dismayed. Yes, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I remember seeing that, and the whole time I spent about a year in my parents' house after college, the whole time I was there, I left that verse on the wall. Because I, I couldn't bear to erase it. It was special. It was amazing. And it just reminded me of, of that, that strength that God gives us, that courage that God gives us in hard times. And it was special that my brother wrote that. And he, he even told me later on, after I, I told him that I left it on there, he told me that was the verse that got him through <laughs> so much of the basic training and all these other things that you have to endure that many of you guys know. And uh, those hard times there, that was the verse. As I was meditating on that in the room that he used to have, he was meditating on that in those barracks with these other guys talking with them, having this little pocket New Testament that they would flip through. It meant a lot. And today, guys, today, it's the same thing. Be strong and courageous. In the moments where life is hard and people are looking at you and you're feeling down, in the moments of persecution where people want to kill you, remember that. You have strength and courage in God. Stand up. You don't have to be a superhero like Superman or something to be, be used by God. You can just be a normal person. In fact, we see Scripture filled with normal people that have this supernatural ability given by God to do something amazing. I would argue Paul is that way. I would argue even more for Peter being that way, a fisherman who stands up in Acts 2 and preaches this message to all these thousands of people walking by him, what strength, what courage he has. Why? Because he knew that it was worth it. Yes, you will suffer. Yes, you will be persecuted. Yes, all these things will happen. As Paul says to the Christians as he walks through Iconium 
in Lystra and in Antioch, he says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. That's in verse 22. But he says it in other places as well, like to his, his little apprentice Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, he says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not may be persecuted. Not, oh, we hope you won't be persecuted. You will. And it's no exception for us today. Now in America, we got it good. We don't feel that persecution like the rest of the world. We don't feel it like the people in China or North Korea or, or the people right now in Ukraine that are gathering on Sundays right now in broken down buildings with a tiny little Bible that, that maybe is burned and, and seared with, with bomb shells, right? And they're saying they're reading the Word of God gathered around despite all the hatred despite all the persecution, despite all the violence around them, they're centered around the Word of God. That's a persecution that we think, but we have persecution in our lives. We have things that happen in our lives that hold us back. It may not be as great as that, but remember, you will be persecuted. And it's up to you to go to the Lord and His Word and find that strength, find that courage, pray to Him, and then do what Paul says in Romans 5. He says this, Rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. Paul is talking about rejoicing when he gets stoned to death. He's shipwrecked. He's, he's beaten with rods and whips and all of this. He's being persecuted so intensely that we would never understand what it feels like to have the torture go on. But he's saying rejoice in our sufferings. When someone says something mean to us, we shut down for days on end and curl up in a blanket and whine. But he's saying rejoice. It's time to do that, church. It's not time to back up and say, oh, maybe not. Maybe, oh, this is too much to bear. I can't handle it. Oh, my delicate soul. No, rejoice in it. Be strong in the Lord in that moment. He keeps going. He says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Listen to that. God uses persecution. He uses suffering. He uses your suffering to shape you into who he wants you to be. It is those intense moments, those hard moments, that shape you into the Christian that God wants you to be. I've shared this poem several times, but there's an amazing poem called The Temper by George Herbert, uh, an old Anglican poet in the 1600s. I'm a nerd, so that's no surprise to you guys. But George Herbert talks about the temper, and we're not talking about the, the, the hulk, hulking out temper. We're talking about tempering a sword. If you've ever been to a Renaissance festival, you, you may have stopped by the blacksmith making something. I don't know what they make, nails and horseshoes, whatever, swords. They take this piece of iron and they heat it up red hot. And they pull it out while it's still glowing, and they place it on the anvil, and they hammer away at it. And they keep doing that, and they have this amazing rhythm with it. Once it starts getting a little dimmer, not quite as red hot, they dunk it in a ice cold water. At the beginning of the day, it's actually a bucket of ice, and it eventually turns into water over time to cool it down. Then what they do is they put it back in the fire. It's this hot and cold, this undulation as C.S. Lewis calls it, the ups and the downs of the Christian life, the good times and the times in which we suffer. That's what, what George Herbert is describing in his poem. And he says, one line says this, that makes the music better, right? You tune my heart and it makes the music better, right? And now I played the guitar for 20 something years. And I'll tell you, uh, Every guitarist in, in here knows and has had that fright 
when you're tightening that string, putting new strings on you, you're tightening that string, and then it pops and it slaps you in the face. And I've had that way too many times to where I'm always like, you know what I'm talking about, right? And it's scary. Maybe that's the amateur stringer, but I, I mean, I'm telling you, it's not, it, it's a scary thing, but God is stretching you. He's contracting you. He's bringing you to the heights and he's using your sufferings so that your music, your praises, you glorifying him will be that much better. And what we see here in Paul's life is that he's rejoicing in these sufferings because God's using them for the edification of the church. It is worth it here. It is worth every moment of danger, every moment of suffering because the church is built up by this and he's going to encourage these disciples. And then what we see in verse 23 is something incredible, something almost brand new to, to Acts now. He's appointing elders in every church. Do you see that? You see on Acts 14.23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. This is after he visited them again, after he spent time with them, after he'd used his suffering for God's glory, he now is establishing these men in these positions, edifying the bride, edifying the church, building them up and strengthening them. And it reminds us of this next point. The church needs men faithful to the call of Christ. We need more men to step up. This church is probably the exception uh, to this, uh, what I'm about to say, but uh, this church is probably the exception. Most churches have very little men helping out. When you do something, when you have anything going on, uh, a VBS, for instance, it's predominantly the, the, the women that step up. And hey, praise the Lord for, for strong women doing it, stepping up when men are, are abject failures and, and not doing what God wants. But in this church, I have seen these men stand up and do it. And if you don't believe me, I mean, just look around you, all the renovations they've done, all the things that they keep wanting to do. Uh, I mean, they're already asking me to clean up my office so they can renovate it. I mean, I, I don't want to do that work, you know, no, but that, that's what the, the men here do. They stand up. The church needs men faithful to the call of Christ. Now, specifically, specifically in verse 23, this is talking about elders. And pay attention to that plural there, elders in every church. The fact that elders is plural, right? There's multiple elders and church is singular, tells you that there were multiple elders in one church. That there were multiple uh, elders is another word, of course, for pastors, for people who oversaw ministry in the church. They have multiple ones in every church. And what we see is that this word elder is used synonymously with the word for overseer that we see in, in 1 Timothy 3. And also in conjunction with the word for shepherd that we see in, in places like 1 Peter uh, 5. These words describe what we call a pastor today. They are shepherding the flock of God. They are overseeing the flock. They are helping the flock. They are, as Christ says in John 21, feeding the flock. Not literally. I mean, I'll, I'll cook for you. But, but feeding the word and that's an illustration I, I give to preachers all the time, other pastors, is that what I'm doing now is presenting a meal to you. I, I'm not, I, I've done so much research in the background of this that I never show you, right? When a pastor preaches, there's hours and hours that goes into it. Bob can attest to this, right? Uh, and, and Daryl and, and David both know as well. Uh, there's so many hours that goes into it, and you just can't say everything. You've got to limit it. And you limit it at the finished meal. I love to cook. I love food. 
And Nick and I go and we, we get food and we cook and, and it's uh, disgusting proportions and that's why I have to lose weight. And it's amazing. But we cook and we, we pull out uh, uh, every ingredient that I own in my house and, and Rachel in her dismay will put it away after I'm done. But uh, it's like just spices and herbs and all of this just scattered around the counter and we're like mad scientists in a kitchen. And you never, I never come out and, and give Rachel a plate and say, this is this with this, 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 this spice and these herbs and I'm not listening, I'm just like, hey, here's a plate of chicken. You know, and, and that's what Sunday is. I prepare throughout the week and, and I'm, I have this and then I give you a meal. I feed you. I'm not going to sit here and just tell you all the ingredients that goes into this. Instead, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it another time, but instead I present to you the word of God and I feed that is a call and the purpose of pastors is to feed the flock, tend to the flock, feed the lambs. That's what John 21 says, as Christ says to Peter. And Peter remembers that. And he says it again in 1 Peter 5. He says this, feed the flock of God that is among you. You are among me right now, right here. And that is my whole goal. I have a pact with Jim over here. And this pact is this. If I preach something other than the gospel, if I preach something other than this word, he's going to pick me up with all his brute strength and throw me out of the door. And I want you to hold that standard to every person behind this pulpit. I don't care if they're my best friend and they're coming to preach. I don't care if it's Bob. And, and, and if he preaches something else, but Bob, if you preach something else, I can't do it. But Jim, is, he's a bouncer, man. And you're out of here, right? That's the standard, the word of God, nothing else. And we should be unashamed by that. The elders here are so important to the health of the church. That's why when a pastor leaves a church, the, the, the church dwindles in size. You guys know that. You've seen it. The, the ebbs and the flows of, of the ministry here over the, the you know, almost 200 years, the pastors leave church dwindles. Pastors come, and that starts coming back. It's just that's how it goes, because the, the structure of the church, the person feeding is important. Now, I'm not any more important than you guys. I want you to know that. You guys are so incredibly important to the whole ministry of this church, and there's nothing that I, I can't do anything other than come up here and preach. Daryl see me swing hammers. It's not pretty. Guys, what we see is a church being built up by Paul and Barnabas providing leadership here. And that leadership is so important to the ministry that we have. There's more than one pastor in these churches. And look at the process of, of what they did to commend these pastors to the Lord, commit them to the Lord. They fasted. And they prayed, very similar to what Antioch and Syria did with Paul and Barnabas in, in Acts 13. They sat there and they fasted and they prayed. And they spent time as a congregation together, making sure that the Lord was in it. That is something that we are, sadly, that we are bad at as a church in America, is waiting on the Lord. We like to rush it. I like to rush it. I like to get things done quick. So if I had someone that was a great elder candidate, my first instinct is, let's do it tonight. But no, let's spend some time. Let's fast. Let's pray. And then what do they do? They lay their hands on them. It doesn't quite say that, but the word they're committed and the word for commended in Acts 13 signify the same action of laying hands on these men. And there's nothing mystical about that. It's not like Benny Hen healing people, you know. That's not what we're doing, right? We're not, we're not trying to be fake healers. We're just laying our hands on there to show them that we support them and we love them and that we want the best for their ministry. And it is a sign that we are in full support of their ministry here at the church or anywhere. And I'll tell you, I hope very soon as our church grows and as our church develops 
that we can install elders like this, other pastors here as well, to help with the work of the ministry and lay our hands on them and pray for them and love on them. That is a good biblical model that we see here. This is where we derive our, our practice of pastoral ordination. Have you guys ever witnessed an ordination service? You have the pastor, and, and most of the time, the ones I've been to, the one that I was ordained in, they put a chair out in the middle, or a couple chairs, pastor and, their, and the wife, and everybody just kind of lines up and goes by and prays with them. It's just this really sweet moment, and I remember mine, First Baptist Church of Mount Healthy, uh, over on the other side, and I remember having that done. Friends that I hadn't seen in years came up and, and visited and, uh, just for this, and I'm not an emotional man, but boy, oh boy, that meant something. Because it was just affirmation from the people of God for the calling that God has placed on my life. There's something special about that and something special for the people there too. I still have people remembering my ordination service. And of course we had a little cake and coffee afterwards, but the, the nice thing was just having that moment of unity in the church. Being there with people I love. There is nothing more special than that. That's what they were doing here, and it's a beautiful thing. Now in verse 24 through 26, they gather, they, they, they leave these people, and they go back to Antioch and Syria. It's confusing because there's two Antiochs. And this is described as where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work they had fulfilled. So here is a contrast between leaders. Paul and Barnabas have finished their missionary journey, their first one, and they have started others on their ministry journey in those cities. And now they're back to where they started, and they gather people together. And, it says, and this is the last point here. What they did here is what you should do. It's you should take every opportunity to glorify God to really celebrate what God is doing. And that's, that's what they say here, is that they are, are celebrating. They gather the church together in verse 27, and they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. They are celebrating with these people because God has been good. This is a church that they love. This is a church that they care for. And they come back to it to say, hey, we love, we love you, and we want to celebrate with you. When something good is happening in your life, in your personal ministry at work, or in your neighborhood, right? Because those are ministries that God has given to you. I want to hear about it. The church wants to hear about it. We want to celebrate with you. I love it. David, David has the, the passion of, of uh, he, he has so much passion and so much excitement about him. It's, uh, it could be intoxicating at times, but uh, if, the good and the bad. No, uh, but no, he just gets so excited about this stuff, and he tells me all the time about sharing the gospel with people at work or talking about this or this or that, and of course he shares struggles too, but at the same time, it's just it's a blessing to hear about it. And to praise the Lord over what God is doing in your lives. I want to hear about it. The church wants to hear about it. When you're faithful to the call of God in your life, you should bring it here. And we should celebrate. We meet weekly. These guys, they haven't seen them in years. But they still come back and they're like, guess what, guys? This is huge. The door has been opened to the Gentiles. This is a Gentile church they're talking to. Antioch of Syria. It's a mix, but they're, they're lots of Gentiles, and they're sharing this with them. And what a blessing it is for this Gentile church to hear about these other churches being started around the, the, the known world. Praise the Lord. And they're excited about it. It was no longer just a gospel reserved for the Jews. It was no longer just God's people and no one else. Now Gentiles 
could be grafted into it. And we see that and that excitement in this, that they wanted to hear about it. And in verse 28 shows us something. It says, and they remained no little time with the disciples. I love when the Bible uses that phrase, no little time. That means they stayed a long time. And you better believe that people wanted to hear about it. And they wanted that story repeated. We all have favorite stories from our life that we've experienced. We all have favorite things that we like to talk about. And we talk about it all the time. So many times, some of us can repeat other people's stories. Right? Right? And you know what? The story of what Christ has done in your life should be one of those stories that you're sharing over and over and over again, and you should take every opportunity you could get to share that story, especially with the people here. I want to know and hear your testimony so much that I could repeat it line for line like a favorite movie that I've watched a thousand times. That's what I want. That's what the rest of the church wants. We want to hear what God has done in your life. We want to hear what God's doing in your ministries at work and in your neighborhoods or with your friend group. We want to hear about that because God is good and he will, he will definitely work through you if you're willing. So don't just remain a little time with us, right? But no little time, long time. I, I make it no secret that I'm, I'm incredibly invested in this church, that uh, Rachel and I are not going anywhere anytime soon. I want to always reiterate that I love you guys, and I want to see what God is doing in your life. I want to be invested in your life to that degree. God called me here for a reason, and I plan on sticking around. And I plan on hearing about what God is doing in your ministries. Not just this church, not just what we do here, but in your personal lives. Let's celebrate that together. God has given us so many delights and a mission-led life. Despite all the dangers, despite all the, the persecution and the suffering, Paul experienced both. And we see at the first half of this passage, intense persecution. But then the second half, what a delight to be in the company of the people of God. All that risk, it's worth it. All that danger, not a problem. All that suffering, it's there to make you stronger. We're in this together, guys. We need to celebrate every chance we can get of what God's doing in your life. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the example of Paul and Barnabas and their faithfulness and mission that they have. Lord, only you, only you are worth in this world. The risk, the danger, the suffering, the, the hardships that we may experience, you are worth it. And God, help us to remain on mission. Help us to stay strong, to be courageous, and to live for you. Lord, there is so much suffering that we will have to endure, so much persecution that we will have. Let us face it with the courage of Christ, with the courage of Paul, with the courage of so many people that have gone before us and have been martyred for the cause of Christ. Lord, let us take inspiration from that. Let us live a bold life for your sake. Lord, it is in Jesus' name that I pray this. Amen.